Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA Network Plus certification training course, the online training course that encourages you to learn responsibly. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about circuit switched WAN technologies. This comes from our Network Plus certification requirement in section 2.5, where we need to categorize a lot of different WAN technology types. We're only going to be looking at the circuit switched versions of these. Our next module will be on the packet switched version. So I've separated them out to make these modules a little bit smaller for you. And we'll talk about what circuit switching is. In the next module, we'll talk about packet switching. And there's some other WAN properties that we'll discuss as we go through these different topology types. The WAN technologies that we'll look at in this module are the circuit switch technology. So we're going to look at something called POTS and PSTN. It's a funny name. We're going to look at T1E1 and T3E3, describe what those are and how those work. And then we'll finally talk about ISDN BRI and ISDN PRI and describe what those are in our circuit switched technologies over the WAN. Circuit switching itself has been around for quite some time. The idea is that you would create a connection between two endpoints, and that connection is always stays up until you're done with it, and then you can break it down again. So it's a lot like a phone call. I pick up my phone, I type in some numbers, and I create a circuit to the other side. And while I'm using that circuit, I'm the only one who has access to that. Whoever I'm calling can hear me, and nobody else can use that line until I hang up the phone and the circuit breaks down again. So the concept of circuit switching is one that's been around for a very, very long time. Part of the challenge you have, though, is if you aren't talking, let's say you create a phone call, you pick up the phone, and you're just sitting there. Nobody's talking on either side. Nobody else can use that circuit. There are resources in use over the wide area network that now nobody else can take advantage of. Even though you're not talking and the other side isn't talking, you still have a circuit that has been built up and that nobody has access to. So it's a relatively inefficient use of resources in that scenario. But the connection is always there. I know I can pick up the phone, I can make a phone call, and it's going to connect to the other side. So the resources are something that are built in place. And as long as you're using that phone line, it is yours and nobody else has access to it. One nice thing about that, however, is if you're buying a circuit, you're buying one of these circuit switched WAN connections, it is guaranteed. It's always going to be there for you. And it's going to give you a set amount of bandwidth because nobody else is sharing that with you. So if you're paying for it, you might as well make the most of it. If you can transfer information over that link, you should transfer it. You could send that data. So uh, if you're going to pay for it, you might as well make some use of it. And since nobody else is going to have access to it, you might as well make the most of it. One very common type of a circuit switched WAN is one we've spoken about already. It's the POTS. POTS stands for Plain Old Telephone Service. And it's referring to our, our phones. Now, POTS is a name we kind of came up after the fact. We didn't call it POTS. We didn't call it the plain old telephone service to begin with. It's just a name that sort of evolved through the years as other types of technologies came out. We needed some way to describe that old methodology that we use for doing telephones. And even though it is an old methodology, it's one that is very much still in use all over the world through something called our PSTN, our Public Switched Telephone Network. This is a lot like the internet, but for phones. And these days, we're having fewer and fewer phones in people's environments. They're using mobile phones. They're not even having the traditional POTS service into their facilities. They're perhaps using voice over IP, which is definitely not a circuit-based type wide area network connection. But this allowed us to connect up all of these phones all over the world and allow you to call internationally from one phone to another. And magically, somehow, it was able to work because it was a standardized, public-switched telephone network. It uses two wires coming into your facility. And the distance between your phone system and that separate machine that is somewhere down the wire that's allowing you to use this telephone can really be that what we call a local loop can really be up to 15,000 to 18,000 feet away here in the US. Different types of cabling and different types of environments will put restrictions on the distances. But as you can see, even in rural environments, I could have a phone that is very, very far away from my central office and still have phone service. So it was a technology that was extremely adaptable really all over the United States and finally worldwide. Unfortunately, one of the disadvantages for the POTS network and the PSTN was that the bandwidths were very, very low. There was a very, there is a very set set of frequencies that can you can transmit through those wires that the equipment will handle. And so the bandwidths that we can get through there are also relatively low. You can see these days we've moved away from modem type communication through these phone lines into higher speed networks. And that's because this type of technology just can't support those higher speeds. 
It used to be if you needed a WAN connection to another site, you needed a T1. Just get your T1 connection. And even these days, we are implementing T1 environments in certain areas, certain organizations. This T1 stands for T Carrier 1. It was a standardization that was created by Bell Labs. And what it did was allow you to have two pairs of wires going into an environment, plugging into equipment that you might have. And those two wires allowed you to communicate to something that was on the other side of this circuit. So being a circuit-based WAN technology, you built the circuit up and it was yours. Nobody else could use it. This T carrier is something you can also hear referred to as a DS1. This is referred to as a digital signal one. If you want to get into very, very specific details, DS1 is the logical bit pattern that's used over a physical T1 line. But what we do in our industry is we tend to just call them the same thing. Oh, I had a DS1 put in. Oh, I had a T1 installed. It's exactly the same thing as the way we talk about it uh, in a conversational type mode. You see T1s in places like North America, Japan, South Korea to some degree. But certainly, it's really focused on North America and Japan and those environments. Everybody else in the world uses different formats for what they're doing. The T1 allows us to have 24 channels inside of it. And each one of those channels is a 64 kilobit wide set of bandwidth. That means overall, if you do the calculations, you can fit 1.536 megabits per second of bandwidth across those links. And when T1s became popular, 1.5 megabit of bandwidth was just huge, amazing amounts of bandwidth you can get through those. When our Ethernet networks were running at 10 megabit per second, or even our token ring networks running at 4 megabit per second, having a wide area network connection of 1.5 megabits was more than ample. Did everything we possibly need. Although these days, 1.5 megabit for some of our streaming technologies for video and for audio probably wouldn't help us very much. Well, as I mentioned, North America and Japan and South Korea may be using T1s, but there was another standard out there in the world called E1. And Europe really took the idea of T1 technology and expanded on it and created a new standard that's standardized in almost all countries except North America and Japan. You really don't see the E1 technologies there. Again, we're using two pairs of wires, just like the T1 did. So the same physical layout even had the RJ45 or RJ48S or RJ48C type connections on there, if you want to be very, very specific. But the amount of bandwidth going through it was a little bit different. We had 32 channels on an E1, again, 64 kilobit of bandwidth. And again, if you do the calculations, that's just over 2 megabit per second of bandwidth. So on an E1, we had a little bit more bandwidth available than a T1. You can see it was a, a future technology than the T1. So the E1 allowed a, us a little bit more flexibility. Well, we know we had a T1 and an E1, but there's also something called a T3 or an E3. This is called uh, also DS3. You'll hear this referred to, which refers to our digital signal level 3. Uh, a T3 takes 28 DS1 channels and combines them into a single pair of coax here. And that means that we can run at almost 45 megabits per second. So this is extremely high rates of speed. Even for some of the speeds that we have going into our home offices where it's cable modems, that might be even faster than what you might have there. And it's a full duplex connection. So this is almost 45 megabit in both directions. So most large organizations that have wide area network connections, they'll put in T3s to make sure they have enough bandwidth. This uses coax cables, though. It doesn't use RJ. 45s has coax with these older style BNC connectors on them. They work great for this T3 type connectivity. In Europe and other places in the world, we have E3, which combines 15 E1 signals to give us about 34 to 35 megabits per second of throughput. And they're still using coax connections. They still have those BNCs on there. They look the same, but it's a different type of signaling going on over that coax to give them that 34.368 megabits per second. The last type of circuit switch technology we'll look at is something called ISDN. And ISDN stands for Integrated Services Digital Network. This is one of the first high speed type networking pieces to be installed at the home level. Many organizations were using this well before getting them at home. But what was nice about this is it used your existing telephone wire to be able to do this. And the kind that we usually got in these slower speeds in our home network is something called BRI, basic rate interfaces. You can also hear it called uh, 2B plus D. The B stands for the bearer channels. That was the channels that we sent our actual data across. And they were two 64 kilobit bearer channels. Now, when your modems 
We're really only going at about 56 kilobits per second. Getting two of these together to give us 128 kilobits of bandwidth was really nice to have in some of these home offices or even in larger corporate environments. There's also another channel on here called the signaling channel, the D channel. And it is a 16 kilobit signaling channel that generally you don't have access to. It's used just for the intercommunication over the ISDN network. There's another type of ISDN called the PRI primary rate interface. This is an ISDN connectivity that's really brought into an environment on a T1 or an E1. Uh, T1, for instance, we had 23 B channels and 1 D for signaling. And E1 had 30 bearer channels, 1 D channel, and a separate channel to send out alarms, which is really important when you're on a WAN network. Now, this is uh, PRI something we still see quite a bit in very large environments that have a PBX. They have their own internal phone system, that branch exchange system. And what they're allowed to do now is bring in an ISDN connection to plug directly in with this one wire. They essentially now have 23 phone lines coming in, where before it would just come in line by line by line by line. So very efficient to bring in ISDN versus bringing in individual analog links. Let's review what we've learned about our circuit switched WAN technologies. Our first question is, what does PSTN stand for? And if you recall, that is something that is our public switched telephone network. That is our phone network that we use with our telephones to be able to communicate on these phones around the world. Our next question is, how many channels of a T1 carry traffic? There are a number of channels inside of that T1. How many channels did we have? Do you recall? 24 channels, and each one of them carries 64 kilobits per second. Our last question is, which circuit switch WAN technologies are often associated with coaxial cables? There was a few that we looked at, a couple that we looked at on this particular module, where we brought in our WAN links over coax. And those were our T3 connections or even our E3 connections. Well, that summarizes what we need to know about these WAN technology types, especially our circuit switch WAN technologies. Our next module is going to be on the packet switched WAN technologies, where we discuss the others that we didn't go through in this list. For that video, for many other Network Plus videos, our message boards, and much more, you can visit our website, freenetworkplus.com.